I'd like to thank the organizers for giving uh, me the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the Benetech story. Uh, we are a publicly traded company listed as BNTC on the NASDAQ and one of the few dual listed companies uh, traded as BLT on the ASX. We're one of the few dual listed companies in both exchanges. Okay. And as such, uh, we are a publicly traded company and there's our safe harbor statement. So Benetech is a company that really uh, develops human therapeutics on the specificity of RNA interference, uh, but instead of using it from an siRNA perspective, we combine uh, the development of RNAi therapeutics with gene therapy delivery vectors. It's a well-validated technology. We are the first company to put non-withdrawable RNAi into human beings. We did this with a self-complementary AAV8 vector expressing three anti-hepatitis C uh, shRNAs in a clinical study run a couple of years back. Uh, we've got our, our company with a number of different pipeline programs, including oncology, uh, orphan genetic diseases, retinal diseases, as well as infectious diseases. And we look to uh, build value for the company either through establishing partnerships or taking some of these products through to commercialization ourselves. Our executive team is headed by Greg West, who's the former CSF, CFO of some of the largest investment banks in Australia. Um, and Dr. Cliff Holloway, who's a former CEO of Siena uh, Cancer Diagnostics, as well as uh, VP of VD at Arana Therapeutics. Some highlights in what you should expect from Benetech in the upcoming years is that we have a phase two clinical study that we will be performing on an antisense EGFR asset uh, in the areas of head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. We also have a unique way to apply RNA interference and the ability to silence disease-causing genes and replace them with normal copies of the same gene. And we'll show that in a uh, clinical program surrounding oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy, which we anticipate getting into a clinic in the second half of 2018. And we have other programs targeting retinal disorders and infectious diseases, as you might expect. We've got a number of different programs based on a broad platform technology. We've raised $40 million in U.S. capital since 2014, and we're a relatively small company with most of our staff based in uh, the Bay Area. So with RNA interference, it's been quite the month with Al Nylum showing some of the initial phase three results, successful phase three results, showing that this is a modality that indeed has the capability of having uh, real clinical outcomes associated with these types of treatments. Yet for companies like Al Nylum or other siRNA companies to have an extended durability of effect, you need to continuously re-administer these drugs as uh, as soon as every two or three weeks in certain cases. At Benetech, we deliver uh, RNAi a little bit different. We do it using DNA plasmids coupled with gene therapy delivery vectors. We're agnostic, but when we do use viral capsids, we tend to skew towards AAV. Uh, these produce short hairpin RNA, which once processed, get clipped and enter the pathways um, and have a similar mechanism of action as the siRNA-based compounds. A couple really important differences. Uh, we don't have to rely upon uh, continuously re-administered compounds to have therapeutic benefit. Instead, we use gene therapy. And again, for this crowd, that's self-evident. In addition to that, because we use endogenous cellular machinery to be able to induce the inhibitory effect, we oftentimes have a lot of excess packaging capacity left over to do other things within those vectors. So again, think about traditional gene therapy where you have autosomal recessive disorders and you're sim simply replacing the enzymes. Or in the case of genome editing where you're putting in large proteins to be able to have an impact on knocking out those disease genes. Because RNA interference uses endogenous cellular machinery already present and the sequences encoding for those short RNA are small, there's oftentimes uh, excess packaging capacity, and that's certain cases where we can use that excess packaging capacity to restore uh, gene function by knocking back in a copy of the wild type gene. Our pipeline looks like this. We'll focus today on the top two programs in head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, as well as the orphan disease OPMD. 
We also have a retinal program where we're developing vectors with 4D MT and a collaboration using their technology uh, to identify uh, novel AV capses that when introduced into the eye through intravitreal injection have broad retinal transduction properties. And following on the basis of our hepatitis C program, we have a follow-on liver program in hepatitis B. For head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, um, one of the reasons why we chose this indication is that the uh, lesions are amenable to local administration through direct intratumoral injection of our compound. The disease itself impacts roughly 64,000 in the U.S. annually. About half of those patients go on to develop recurrent metastatic disease, untreatable. Importantly, over 90% of head and neck lesions overexpress EGFR, and certain therapies are already on the market, like cetuximab, a monoclonal antibody meant to bind EGFR. Uh, we acquired a phase two ready program by taking an investment from Patrick Sung Shung uh, at NAND Ventures, uh, who has invested into the company, and along with his investment came this phase two clinical asset. In two early stage clinical studies, in the first where we uh, used BB401 as a monotherapy, it's a plasmid with a promoter driving in the antisense EGFR RNA, and it's administered directly into tumors by intratumoral injection. In that small study, uh, albeit small, we saw a 29% objective response rate in which two lesions completely cleared and an additional three lesions showed reduction uh, by resist criteria. Additional pa two patients uh, achieved stable disease. Uh, this is uh, when compared against cetuximab as a monotherapy. Cetuximab is only able to achieve roughly a 5 to 13 percent uh, objective response rate when used as a monotherapy. Importantly, what we did see, as you can see in the panel on the right-hand side, is that the patients that were either the complete responders or partial responders correlated to a high surface level expression of EGFR, and the patients that had progressive disease had relatively low levels of EGFR. And this really goes to the fact that this is a disease that really needs to have a diagnostic component assessed to it. In addition to that, there was a follow-on small six-patient study in which EGFR, uh, this EGFR antisense asset was used in combination with cetuximab as well as radiation. And of the six patients, five showed an objective response rate with four of those patients have complete ablation of their lesions. In panel A, you can see uh, panel A and B are lesions from the same patient. Lesion A was uninjected, whereas in lesion B, that was co-treated with BB401. Uh, the patient, in addition to that, received cetuximab as well as radiation. You can see at the end of the study, the untreated lesion with BB401 still remained, uh, albeit slightly reduced size, whereas the lesion in panel D, which was treated with BB401, was completely ablated. Uh, this is a uh, compound we're going to take into phase two clinical studies in a 50-patient study, uh, which will be initiating Q1 of 2018, and it's really meant to be paired up with a diagnostic against DGFR. I'm going to move very quickly in my uh, remaining minutes of this talk to cover OPMD. OPMD is a rare genetic disease. It's an autosomal uh, dominant disorder uh, caused by a gain-of-function mutation. It's a relatively rare disease, disease with a prevalence of one in 100,000, although it does appear typically in clades of patients, uh, most particularly in places like Israel, France, French-speaking Canada, as well as in the United States. Uh, it's called oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy because the primary muscles that are impacted first are within the eyelids, which is in generally not life-threatening, but it's really the swallowing dis, uh, difficulties or dysphagia that really causes these uh, patients uh, problems. Eventually, proximal limb weakness can occur in patients who do not succumb to uh, the dysphagia. With uh, OPMD, there is a primary cause of disease. It's a polyalanine expansion disease. And like many types of expansion diseases, this causes the proteins to misfold causing nuclear aggregates. Aggregates eventually cause not only loss of uh, the gene function, but in addition to that, acquisition of fibrosis within those tissues. 
Currently, there's no other therapeutics on the market uh, to be able to treat OPMD patients. The only uh, treatments available are something known as a myotomy, which is physically cutting the cricopharyngeal muscle within these patients to relieve tension, or inject localized uh, injections of Botox to uh, reduce the overall amount of tension within that muscle. With uh, OPMD, uh, because the PABPN1 gene is the causative agent of this, we've developed an RNAi therapeutic where we use uh, two single SHRNAs to be able to knock down the mutant uh, form of the protein. Given the nature of the mutation, it's not capable of selectively uh, discriminating against the wild type allele from the diseased allele. So within the same therapeutic vector, we've now introduced a codon-optimized SHRNA insensitive version of the same wild type protein. And so the idea is, is that you don't have these SHRNAs, which are self-competing, and coming back and trying to knock down this normal copy of the protein that you're expressing. The real advantage of having a one-vector system is, is you have one manufactured process, one CMC review, one set of stability results that need to be accumulated. It's, in general, you're, you're not dealing with multiple products trying to go into a clinical study, which vastly simplifies the ability to administer. There's one validated animal model, uh, well-validated animal model, where you knock in a PABPN1 expanded protein. You essentially mimic many of the uh, phenotypic conditions associated with the disease, including progressive muscle weakness and atrophy, fibrosis, as well as intranuclear inclusions. What we see on the left-hand side of the panel in mice treated with the vector is that at high doses of BB301, the clinical candidate, that we have the ability to knock out nearly 88% of the mutant form of the protein. And in the same muscles coming back and measuring for the expression of the wild-type protein, we can express protein levels up to 91%. So this is really, truly a silence and replace type of mechanism where we take out the disease-causing protein and reintroduce a normal copy. In terms of uh, intranuclear inclusions, uh, on the left-hand side of this panel are muscle cross-sections, which shows standing for the intranuclear inclusions. In the top left, you obviously see no intranuclear inclusions. In the A17 panel, to the right of that, the green dots represent uh, cells with intranuclear inclusions. And when you treat with BB301 onto mice with existing A17 intranuclear inclusions, you essentially knock them back down to wild-type levels. Lastly, uh, last piece of data I'll show, this is a disease of lack of muscle strength. The question is, is can we restore muscle strength uh, in this model? What you see is the wild-type mice and the light gray bar at the top, which were simply treated with saline. And then the A17 mice you see on the bottom, and this is measuring restoration of muscle force with single doses of BB301, either a low or high dose, you essentially restore muscle uh, strength back to wild type levels. More importantly, as A17 uh, mice uh, lose the ability to function with these muscles, they have significant reduction in the muscle size, resulting in atrophy, resulting in roughly a 25% decrease. Treatment of BB301 over a 14-week time point essentially restores muscle uh, size back to normal levels. Uh, just as a summary, uh, this is, we believe, a fairly unique uh, therapeutic mechanism of action where we can use a single vector system to essentially knock out a disease-causing protein and as long as the viral packaging capacity allows for the size of the gene, you can simply knock back in a wild-type copy to essentially restore function. So it's a, a little bit of a new paradigm to treat disease rather than simply overexpress to replace enzyme function or simply knock out an autosomal dominant gain-of-function type of disease. Uh, we anticipate in being able to get this into the clinic the second half of the 2018. We have regulatory uh, meetings with the age, relatively, relative agencies in each of the countries uh, where the majority of these patients are seen, uh, scheduled in the next few weeks. Um, and 
I will essentially leave it there as I'm running out of time. This is the uh, overall goals of Benetech within the next uh, 12 to 18 months, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.